Making an album has never been easy for Radiohead. After creating their most conceptually important release, and one of the greatest albums of all time, they followed up with Kid A, in quite possibly the greatest left turn in music history. Their trajectory seemed to level out after Amnesiac. How couldn't it? They had made creative leaps with each subsequent release. Pushing further appeared pointless, if not impossible. But they tried anyways. Hail to the Thief was angry, politically charged, and perhaps a bit overloaded with ideas. It was the last album released in their six-album contract with EMI, and after completing their world tour in support of Thief, the band went on hiatus. They no longer had any contractual obligations to make new music, and plenty of good reasons to quit Radiohead altogether. But in 2007, with only 10 days notice, they'd released their landmark record in Rainbows, and give it away for free. After 2004's Hail to the Thief, Radiohead were bored of the whole process. Recording, playing live on stage, all of it. The Hail to the Thief tour was their last commitment to a major label, and it had stopped being fun. They were sleep deprived, and had all fallen ill in the last leg of their tour. And when it was over, everyone just disappeared. Each member went off on their own, forgetting about it. When Radiohead began, they were all teens who happened to stumble on a worldwide hit with Creep. Now, they were well into their 30s with young children of their own and a celebrated discography behind them. There was more to their lives than Radiohead, and music was no longer the center of their attention. So they stopped working. But after a few months, even rest began to feel weird and unhealthy. This time, however, it would take the band some time to work their way back into it. They hadn't lost interest, only momentum. The group needed a purpose to continue, because each album cycle brought an element of discomfort. The band spent a lot of time in the studio not really going anywhere. They had plenty of ideas and discussed making the record sound very organic, but had no real direction. Feeling frustrated that they were wasting their time, they considered splitting up. But they persisted, because despite all of the disappointment, the core of these new songs had so much potential. There were two key problems that seemed to hold them back. The first was that without a label contract, Radiohead had no distributor or a deadline. The second? that they had yet to locate a producer to help them see the project through. Longtime producer Nigel Godrich was busy recording for Paul McCartney and Beck, but recording on their own wasn't cutting it. So in December of 2005, they enlisted Spike Stent, known for his work with U2 and Oasis, to help bring them focus. It didn't work. Their progress continued to linger, and the group parted ways with Stent shortly thereafter. Then, another problem arose. Tom York was getting bored of being in Radiohead. The recording process thus far had become a self-perpetuating slog, so he began working on a solo release, alone with his computer and samples. It was something he felt he had to do in order to break the creative rut. With York starting on his own record and Godrich unavailable, it became quite clear that Radiohead wasn't moving forward. To help break their stagnation, they decided to head back on tour for the 2006 festival season, bringing with them their new half-formed tracks. Suddenly, they were being spontaneous. No one was self-conscious because they weren't in a studio. They felt like those teens again, and they realized that they just couldn't repeat the songwriting methods that had worked for them in the past. In turn, it ended up helping them pull these songs together. York released his solo record The Eraser in July of 2006. A modest release from the frontman, but ultimately, its greatest accomplishment was in re-energizing York's creativity, freeing in him a boldness that he had lost. In the fall, the group re-enlisted Godrich on the project and headed to Tottenham House to begin recording. The producer gave them a much-needed push in the right direction, helping strip down their arrangements, making them more minimal. They recorded Jigsaw Falling Into Place and the fuzzy rock anthem Body Snatchers during those sessions. No those lush and immediate sounds set the tone for the record going forward. In the winter, they headed to another mansion, Hallswell House. There, the band recorded the slow-burning piano ballad videotape and Nude, a track they had been attempting to put on tape for nearly a decade. In the spring, the band met with their managers, who had a suggestion. Since they were without a record deal, why not release the album themselves online? They had turned down multi-million dollar offers for a new major label deal. They could cut out the middlemen, 
bypass the traditional means of releasing a record and broadcast directly to the people who were interested in their music. Then, another idea. How about letting people decide how much they wanted to pay for it? If anyone could get away with it, it was Radiohead. It's what would give them that final push to complete the record and get it out there. They also had no idea of the consequences, which only made it more exciting. It was to be a rebellious reinvention, and the most audacious experiment the industry had seen in years. Finally, after torturous rearranging and rewriting, they had wrapped up their sessions in the summer of 2007. They had produced 16 total tracks, but feeling that Hail to the Thief was too long, they decided that they wanted this new record to be concise, and settled on only 10 tracks. In Rainbow sees the band happy in their own skin, shedding the bulk of OK Computer's trademark anxiety and Kid A's barren soundscapes, while still remaining distinctly Radiohead. In Rainbow's brings us somewhere sublime. This new warmth is apparent right from the bright opener, 15 Step. A hybrid of Kid A and OK Computer stylings, it sounds like someone let the light in on Idiotech or Airbag. That raw power carries over into the next track, before delivering the album's most beautiful moment, Nude. The beauty to Body Snatcher's Beast, it's a dreamy ballad that ends with York's blissful croon and a swelling string section. These songs sound personal, and York's vocals have transitioned from punk rage to more of an R&B falsetto. The fleet of building arpeggios on weird fishes, arpeggi, brings listeners through York's desire to break free and take a leap of faith. There's very little anger in In Rainbows. If anything, it feels romantic. They had moved away from suburban paranoia towards sensuality, to themes of love and desire, double-edged swords by definition. The mesmerizing All I Need begins with a token R&B rhythm section, before building towards a climax containing a wall of synths, pianos, and white noise. The finger-picked folk interlude, Faust Art, cleanses the palate for Reckoner, perhaps the most immediate track on the album. It features York's greatest vocal performance and is one of the best moments in Radiohead history. <laughs> Reckoner was the early working title for In Rainbows, eventually taking its title from another one of the song's lyrics. The ethereal house of cards offers a breather after an astounding five-song streak. It's a mellow and summery serenade adjectives not commonly reserved for previous Radiohead outings. Jigsaw falling into place revives a bit of that breakneck pace from earlier in the album. Bringing the whole thing full circle before concluding on the trance-like videotape. A fitting close for such a human album. When the album was completed, guitarist Johnny Greenwood took to the band's blog, Dead Airspace, to announce the record and that it would arrive in 10 days. In the early morning of October 10th, 2007, users flocked to inrainbows.com, where they could download the MP3 version of the album for whatever price they deemed fit, including zero dollars. It was a landmark use of the pay-what-you-want model, hailed as a revolution in the way major bands sell their music. Time called it easily the most important release in the recent history of the music business. Bono of U2 praised Radiohead as courageous and imaginative in trying to figure out some new relationship with their audience. But their tactic also came with criticisms. Singer Lily Allen called the release arrogant, saying it sends a weird message to younger bands who haven't done as well. You don't choose how you pay for eggs. Why should it be different for music? Journalists wrote that Radiohead had made it impossible for less successful musicians to compete and make a living from their music. The problem with those criticisms is that they end up sounding like one of the old record companies, forgetting what music is all about. Excitement and talent and artists doing cool new things that people are into. That's what the record companies had forgotten about. They were worrying about all of these additional questions and forgetting about the primal urge of people just wanting to share and enjoy music. And there's always going to be a way of finding money or livings to be made out of it. 
It was Radiohead's cultural currency, financial situation, and impeccable timing that made this possible. It wasn't meant to become some new industry standard. An online survey company found that during October, over 60% of downloaders took the album for free, while the rest paid an average of $6. The number of downloads weren't clear, but it apparently netted the band an instantaneous $3 million. Without middlemen and zero material costs, it worked out in Radiohead's favor. In December 2007, York said that Radiohead had made more money from the digital sales of In Rainbows than the digital sales of all previous Radiohead albums combined. In Rainbows eventually became the band's best-selling record since OK Computer, moving 3 million copies worldwide. It proved that Radiohead could release a record on the most secretive of terms, basically for free, without a label, and still be wildly successful, even as industry profits continued to plummet. The most important reason for In Rainbows' success was the quality of the music. It was more than any fan could hope for. No wasted moments, no weak tracks. It proved that if you make good work, you can secure the patronage of your fans. It's a masterful album, even if it's their least ambitious. It's not the great artistic leap that was OK Computer, or a startling genre shift like Kid A. Instead, In Rainbow should be remembered as the perfect synthesis of the different sounds Radiohead embraced over the previous decade. It fused the arena rock of the Benz with the heart and soul of OK Computer and the sonic experimentation of Kid A and Amnesiac. It was familiar, but new. This time around, the band was content with the medium being the message. The cover art departs from the impersonal and apocalyptic imagery of previous albums, and the music does the same. It's warm and inviting, offering a glimmer of hope after their last three albums. The name In Rainbows was meant to present that desire to get somewhere that you're not. And for Radiohead, it did just that. It became an opportunity for the band to reconnect. In Rainbows led to a shinier, happier, and freer Radiohead. It's a new year, and that means it's time to start focusing on yourself. Set and reach your goals with this week's sponsor, Skillshare. In his class, Real Productivity, How to Build Habits That Last, Thomas Frank can guide you in building habits that will last you through 2020 and beyond. You can get full access to the class using the first link below. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They offer thousands of inspiring classes in productivity, photography, music making, and a lot more. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than 10 bucks a month, but you can use the link in the description to get two months of premium membership and explore your creativity now. Make 2020 a year where you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's online classes. Thanks for listening to me talk about my favorite Radiohead album. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe if you loved it. Middle 8 merch is now live, or you can support the channel via Patreon. Links to both are in the box below. And tell me, what's your favorite Radiohead album? And if it's not in rainbows, cheer up, kid. That's it for me. Thanks for watching, and keep listening.